My name is Alexandra Lazarovich, and I'm a member of the Whitefish First Nation. Growing up in Canada, I've heard many opinions about who I was or who I was supposed to be as an Aboriginal person. As Native people, we know that there's certain stories that are told about us and that are lived about us and then they become part of our lived experience. Racist stereotypes of Native people that typically arise around the polar opposition of, of noble and uh, degraded savages. They are uh, degraded versions of their own ancestors. Drunks, you know, welfare. People ask you where you learned to talk so well or ask you whether you only had to read half the books in law school parents or grandparents didn't want to identify as Aboriginal because of the prejudices that some of them had to face. The reality was it was there. In high school, they would run around me and do woo-woo. And, and that was one instance, I think, where I felt, my goodness, you know, these people don't even know who I am. They only see the TV Indian person. All of these are images which don't conform to anything about lived reality. And in any case, when that arises, then people are endangered in various ways. And they become dehumanized, and they become the subjects of all kinds of dangerous practices. For decades, partial truths and stereotypes have formed the Canadian public's ideas of Aboriginal peoples. But how have these perceptions affected our individual and collective sense of identity? What are the factors that shape who we are as Aboriginal peoples? Long ago, when explorers sailed west from Europe in their wooden ships, they sought a northwest passage to the Orient. What they found was a new world. Since the first early interactions between European colonists and Aboriginal peoples of Canada, a number of treaties, acts, and laws were established. Early settlers made up labels to identify Aboriginal peoples, which are still used today. Indians, Eskimos, Indigenous, Native American, First Nations, Treaty, Status, Non-Status, Urban Indian, Inuit, and Métis. Ultimately, the legal control over who is an Aboriginal person still resides with the federal government. Being Aboriginal is both a public or cultural perception, but it's also a legal category. The Indian Act today uh, creates a legal, several legal categories of Aboriginal people and uh, uh, those people have that legal standing only through participation in that system. There are many distinct Aboriginal cultural groups across Canada, from Cree to Ojibwe to Gitsan to Blackfoot, each with their own unique customs, culture, and traditions. However, the Canadian Constitution only groups Aboriginal people into three legal categories, Indians, Métis, and Inuit. When you think about it historically, our communities had our own ways of defining who was a community member, and it wasn't based on race or blood quantum or, or, or any of those things. We had ways of adopting people into our nations, uh, ways of integrating between nations, uh, and ways of continually evolving and defining ourselves as who we are. Identities have always been changing throughout time, right? And we've always had the right to do that. And it was with this, you know, interference on the part of the state that suddenly it became so prescribed and so static about who is what and what you are. Why as Indigenous people in Canada are we distinct in terms of identity issues is because it's been formed for us by the state. The Indian Act is federal legislation first passed in 1876. For over a century, the Indian Act has controlled every aspect of Aboriginal life and identity. To be federally recognized as an Indian, individuals must be able to comply with a very distinct standard of government regulation laid out in the Indian Act. These are the different legal categories of Aboriginal people. Status Indian, a person who is legally registered as an Indian under the Indian Act. Non-status Indian, a person who is not registered as an Indian under the Indian Act. Inuit, an Aboriginal people in Northern Canada who live in Nunavut, 
Northwest Territories, Northern Quebec, and Northern Labrador. Métis, people of mixed First Nation and European ancestry who identify themselves as Métis, as distinct from First Nations people, Inuit, or non-Aboriginal people. First Nations, a term that came into usage in the 1970s to replace the word Indian. However, no legal definition of it exists. The laws of Canada have primarily been exclusive. The main focus of them is to limit who can be, who can be Indian at a loss, I think, of a much fuller, deeper, richer understanding of who we are as a people. If you look at the various definitions of indigenousness, it comes down to different, uh, a particular set of things. Sometimes it's priority. Are you the descendant of the group that was there first? Sometimes it has to do with cultural practice. Uh, for example, do you have a particular kind of spirituality and you are not a member of, of a world religion like uh, Islam or Christianity? Are you a speaker of uh, your indigenous language? My problem with all this is that it's easy to find people deficient on those terms. Checklist notions of indigeneity, do you have these and these properties, don't work. Because there are ind people who are rightfully indigenous people who don't fit those criteria. It was in the past, you know, um, decided at a certain point in history, and it's kind of arbitrary sometimes about who was where and how which communities get defined as what always from an exterior source, right? And we have to always be mindful of the fact that this wasn't ours to begin with. It was a very deliberate strategy of dividing us so that we begin to fight amongst ourselves among the meager resources that are there. For more than 100 years, the Indian Act stated that status Indians were considered to be wards of the state and were unfit to take care of themselves and their children. Aboriginal children across Canada were forcibly removed from their homes and sent to residential schools, a boarding school system created by the Canadian government and run by the churches. It was a way to strip Aboriginal children of their language and culture and assimilate them into Canadian society. Many students at residential schools were subjected to severe physical, psychological, and sexual abuse. For many survivors, attending residential schools was a negative experience that impacted generations of Aboriginal families and created a deep sense of shame about being Aboriginal. These historical and legal perspectives are aspects of how our identity is formed, but it was time to examine our backgrounds and cultural influences. I spoke with three members of Aboriginal communities in Alberta. No matter where I meet Aboriginal people, one of the first things you ask is where are you from? We identify with that. No matter who we are as Aboriginal people, where are you from, eh? Kikano Métis Settlement. We're in the northeast part of the settlement now, so we're heading west. To the other end of the settlement is 20 kilometers, and then 20 kilometers to the south. What does Kikano mean again? That means our home in Cree. So, this is it, this is our home. The Kikano Metis settlement is 107,000 acres, or you know, four and two thirds townships. That's a good chunk of land. It creates, you know, opportunity for us. The Metis people were always good hunters, and they were always kind of tied to the hunting and uh, and having that ability to live off the land. So you know, those ties have always been there. On Kikano here, uh, I am an entrepreneur. We have a buff, uh, buffalo ranch here, bison ranch. Uh, we have horses, we have pets. My wife's a uh, dog breeder, so the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well here. These big guys here, they're our team that pull our carriages. This here is Max and Jake here. A lot of our history was around the horses and everything else too, and you know, it, 
in the early years it was transportation and Give me some first. a lot of times your life probably depended on it. Another way is keeping the culture alive is through the raising bison. Uh, ties to our history in that. I've always had the dream of owning my own bison ranch when I was young. We as the Métis settlement members, I guess, are fortunate where we don't have blood quantum as part of the makeup of our, uh, of what makes you Métis or not. Uh, the Métis National Council uh, definition is you have to be tied back to the Red River. You know, so any one of those other nationalities with an Aboriginal woman could create a Métis person. You know, you know skin color, you, you see it where, I know my wife faced that a few times where she's light, fair skinned and light hair. And people, oh, she's not Métis. How do you prove you're Métis? How, how do you prove your identity, you know? Whether your ties go back to Red River or back to Scrip or whatever, eh? You know, some of those issues are coming forward now. So that's another process that we will have to define. I grew up thinking I was full Aboriginal, you know, like I was just originally from the reserve. And it wasn't until I moved to the settlement that I actually developed the sense of, you know, that I was a Métis person and that's who I was. I went through a really troubled time in my life. I started getting into drinking a lot and drugs. <laughs> yeah, and missing school, you know, just not having a care in the world. And I got really kind of depressed and, you know, I had a lot of, like, uh, issues with suicide, suicidal thoughts around the thing and kind of, you know, I just felt like I was stuck there and that there was nothing to do, so... I called my dad and um, I told him kind of what I was going through and he invited me to live with him. And ever since then, I've been living in Buffalo Lake and that was a, since the age of 14. I identify myself as a Métis and I am proud of it. I, like, I love being who I am. I love having the heritage that I have. I'm very proud of it. I really feel tied to the Métis community and I really want to go and give back to my community before I give back to anywhere else because that's where I got my roots from and that's where I kind of developed into the person that I am today. I wanted to look into my own family roots and learn more about how my family stayed strong and kept our culture alive. Can you tell me about you being an Indian princess? I've always been an Indian princess. <laughs> well, how old were you when you won that title? I think I was 19 years old. I just got back from Ontario. Uh -huh. And um, there was this princess pageant. And my mom said, OK, you want to run? I'll make, you, I'll make you whatever you need, you know? So she made me my outfit. So I became the Indian princess. But it, we had to sell all these tickets. But we also had to, I had to make a speech at, uh, at the uh, Friendship Center, and there were five panelists. And so we had to, I, I had to talk about my views as to what I wanted to do, right? It's not a, it's, it's a role, right? And I think a lot of people have to understand that there are different roles you play. But being Indian is not a role. Being Indian means who you are, the very person you are, the very essence of your soul the roots that you come from. I was born in Gruart, Alberta, small community on the shores of Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, very, uh, from very humble beginnings. My mom and dad uh, had to do a lot of things to be, make a living. And we were brought up with uh, an ethic that said that you had to work really hard in order for you to be able to get where you want to go. And my mom was the driving force of our culture and making sure that we knew who we were. We always had that that, that sense of pride, that sense of knowing, the sense of my grandma was always around, our aunts were always around, that maternal and matrilineal line was always lived to the fullest by my mom. She knew if we didn't, we didn't know who we were that we'd get lost somewhere, and she never wanted that. So she was always strong in terms of what she taught us and how she taught us, and knowing who we were, knowing the very essence of that identity. She taught us everything about life and family and how to survive in this world.
when you have strong ties to your community, you can go anywhere in this world and you always feel safe that you have a place to go home. I know that the retention of your culture, a lot of it is based on the retention of your language. If you lose your language, you lose your culture. And we're very fortunate here to have our own school in Kikano. Cultural programs that they put in into the curriculum is awesome. You know, they're, they're teaching them Cree. They're, they have fiddle groups in that. And they also did jigging. You know, that's part of the Métis culture. That's being taught in our school. People know that I'm Aboriginal by my skin tone, but they'll know I'm Métis if they know about a Métis sash. And a lot of people take curiosity to this because they see the different colors and they figure it symbolizes something. So I'm glad when they ask. To me, I guess it's just identify. It helps to identify who I am when I'm in public. A sash still is a symbol of my Métis culture and my Métis identity, but at the same time, I'm still gonna use it for the same things our ancestors did, which is a tool, whether it's, you know, a scarf or just something to wrap around your bag and carry. So when I would actually wear my, my Métis sash around my neck, people would be like, oh, nice scarf. And I'd be like, actually, it's not a scarf, but it is, it's a Métis sash. And I would start to, you know, kind of tell them about Métis heritage, everything, that I do know I'd be willing to share because I just want people to know that our people are out there and that we exist. Identity for me was just knowing that I have Aboriginal culture and not only because of the color of my skin, it's just uh, knowing that, you know, I, I have those Aboriginal roots. Part of the current Indigenous world is those adverse circumstances and the scarring that that creates, but it can also create positive outcomes. You know, uh, people can uh, be motivated to uh, reestablish their connection to what it was their parents and ancestors had in mind and how to live. And all people all across Canada are doing that. We, we have to be realistic about the fact that our societies and our laws have been impacted by colonialism, but we don't have to be defined by that. People are on, on all different kinds of levels, uh, pushing back the, the colonial story and creating new stories for ourselves. So much of what's written about Native people, whether it's in the media or, or whatever's produced about us, is negative and it kind of pathologizes Indigenous people. And so I wanted to write something that was like, well, no, it's not all negative. And in spite of all that people are up against, look at this magnificence that, that is there in terms of people's identities. We have to start making sure people know and understand their language. They have to be able to uh, understand their, the teachings in order for them to be able to uh, come together as a people again. Young Aboriginal people in this country are operating at a whole other level now. And a lot of them are becoming very sophisticated in terms of law and politics. And they're communicating this to each other with all kinds of social media. And a new world is coming. It's up to us as the next generation to just take that step forward and, you know, not have to lean back on what had happened to our people. That, you know, it's up to us to push forward and just to, you know, create the change and be the difference for our future generations. As an Aboriginal woman, I've come to understand that Aboriginal identity is a unique and personal journey, and legal definitions don't have the power to define us. We have to look to our vibrant communities, our loving families, our beautiful culture, and unique language to form our identity. Mm -hmm.